Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this session. Uh, I know that we are the last wall between you and the Flinkfest, so we, are, we will try to be fast. Um, today, we are going to talk about invalid traffic detection uh, with Flink. So we are trying to present this talk. Um, my name is Fares, and here is Juan. We are both software engineers at Criteo, and we work in the team that has to deal with invalid traffic to detect invalid traffic and to mitigate, to mitigate it. Through this session, we'll first talk about invalid traffic in the attack in this industry in general. So what are the fraud schema, how people are making money with it. Uh, we'll then see what is the first solution that we put in place to defeat the fraudsters. Then how Flink resolved most of uh, our issues. And we'll finish by a tour of the Kafka usage and how we handle watermarks at Criteo. Okay? But first, a small background of Criteo. So Criteo is a, an advertising company. Uh, basically, it makes the bridge between advertisers and publishers. When an, an advertiser wants to make a digital campaign, it will call Criteo, give them a, a budget and a catalog, and Criteo will choose the right project to display in front of the right people. So to give you a sense of the volumetry we have to deal with, here are some numbers. So we have 16 DCs worldwide. All of them are operated internally. We have more than 50,000 servers worldwide um, and about 400 billion messages per day. So invalid traffic in the ad tech industry. Let's first explain what is invalid traffic. And to do that, I will simply explain what is valid traffic. So a valid traffic is simply a traffic coming from a human with a genuine intent. So basically, it's you behind your computer. Everything else can be considered as invalid traffic. So for instance, we have botnets. Here's an example of Mirai botnet. I don't know if you heard about it. Uh, it was a massive botnet that used to, use, uh, used to be uh, used in the invalid traffic uh, schemes. Then we have ClickFarms. ClickFarms is almost the same thing as a botnet, but with real devices. You may have uh, people behind them, or everything can be operated uh, automatically. You also have malwares, uh, such as all the toolbars that you can install uh, into your favorite browsers, and all the self-declared uh, robo crawlers, uh, scrappers, and everything that can browse the, the, the web. OK, so what's the purpose of making invalid traffic? Of course, it's to make money. And I will explain to you how they can make money in the next slide. But there is also another use case, and maybe other use cases, uh, which is defeating your competitors. So for instance, you have this software uh, that can protect your uh, website by, bo uh, by being clicked by bots. And the funny thing about this software is that the same company is selling the protection and the, the malware. So as you can see, they state that people can use the software to uh, defeat the competitors. OK, so where is the money? Where is the money? Uh, to understand how people can make money, you first need to understand how the cash flow circulates in the attack industry. So as I said, you have first the advertisers who give a budget to Criteo. With this budget, we'll buy some traffic uh, to traffic sellers. So a traffic seller can be an SSP, uh, such as Atform, or a platform such as Facebook. The traffic seller will give, a, will give a cut of this money to the end publisher where we will display the ad. So in exchange of money, we'll put an ad on the publisher website. So one way to make a fraud scheme is to create fake publishers. You can create a, a bunch of fake websites, then bring IVT on your website, and what will happen is that you will have more traffic, so more displays, and at the end, more money. If it happens that people are clicking on your ads, then it's still way more money. OK, so as you saw, Criteo is not directly impacted by invalid traffic. So you may wonder, why do we care? First reason is ethics. We don't want to put ads in front of robots. Uh, then we have reputations. 
if it happens that people are seeing ads on fake publisher websites, they may wonder, OK, what Criteo is doing with uh, those publishers? Is Criteo part of this scheme or not? And the last one, the financial impact. Uh, so if an advertiser found out that it has IVT, we will have to give them refunds. And if we uh, found out too, we'll have to, to give them back their money. Advertisers, if they found that there is a lot of IVT, they will tend to spend their budget in other medias so, such as TV or uh, media print. And last thing but not least, it's the infra cost. Invite traffic costs a lot into our, uh, in our infrastructures. OK, so I will now explain one of the solutions we put in place to defeat the fosters. So imagine you have Alice, which is browsing some publisher websites. The publisher website will ask Rito to buy the traffic to be able to put an ad on it. What we will do is we will check if the user is suspicious or not. To do that, we will do a lookup into a cache that contains all kind of uh, information about the user, so IPs, user agent, uh, UIDs, and so on. If the user is not blacklisted, then we will display the ad. So the main question here is, how do we feed this cache here? So there is a multiple, there is multiple ways. And I will here explain only one way that uh, involves Flink and the streaming world. So let's take a look deeper into this. Uh, into this. So when the request came in, what we do is we put it in Kafka. Then we created an IVT detection application. Um, and the purpose of this uh, application is to basically, we want to put some business logic in it, saying, uh, OK, we want to detect all the IPs that have more than 1,000 displays during the last hour. So this is basically a rule engine. And this rule engine will feed the cache. OK? So we tried uh, to use Kafka API to do that, knowing that before Kafka API, we already tried uh, Apache Storm and uh, Spark Streaming, but it didn't really fit our use cases. So what we ended, ended up doing was recreating the wheel. Why is that? It's because Kafka doesn't provide some um, basic uh, blocks to create a big um, uh, streaming application. So first, it doesn't have a real windowing system. It relies on uh, Kafka internals. And to do a window, everything is pushed into some Kafka topics. So it has a big cost into our Kafka clusters. Then there is no watermark. Uh, what we used to, to do windowing was the event timestamp inside the message. And as you know, there is late messages. So you have to deal with a bunch of stuff uh, to make it work. And also, um, we push this application into our Mesos cluster. So we have Mesos and Yarn in Criteo. The, the purpose of, of those tools is you know that at any time, the uh, Yarn container can be killed, and the Mesos instance can be, can be killed too. So we needed to implement a checkpoint mechanism, or read from the past uh, from Kafka. But it, has, uh, it had a, a huge disadvantages. Uh, yeah. So uh, at the end, we are using the low-level Kafka API, and we are basically recreating a whole, a whole framework. And so I will give the mic to Juan, who will explain to you how we use uh, Flink. Sorry. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Um, OK, so basically, what we started doing uh, before going with Flink was um, making a list of all the things that we, we consider important uh, in a framework. And I'm going to go one by one. Uh, the first one is the Kafka API. We didn't want to uh, implement clients based on different versions and, and bother ourselves with that. So uh, the Kafka API was important. Uh, the second one was the built-in watermarks mechanism. Uh, we handle our own watermarks. We produce them, and then consume them in Flink. So I'm going to explain that later, uh, how we do it. So that was also another uh, key feature that we, that we needed. Windowing, like most of the rules that we, that we have to detect invalid traffic are, are based on, on windowing, time windowing. So 
uh, this was another key feature. Uh, scalability, we have huge volumes of data and we, ne we need it to scale easily. Um, checkpointing, uh, basically uh, to be able to deploy new versions and, and, and recover from failures. And, and the last point, which is uh, SQL. Uh, most of the rule engines uh, usually have like two teams uh, working on, on it. Uh, you usually have one team that is focused on building the rules and then you have another one that is uh, focused on, on maintaining and, and building the engine. Um, and usually you can have like a DSL as, as an interface between them. And in our case, we chose SQL. And the reason for that is because the team that uh, produces the rules in, in, in our uh, case, uh, they do it using SQL. They don't use Flink for that yet, but they use uh, Hive. So uh, going from uh, a SQL written in, in Hive uh, to Flink was uh, kind of straightforward in, in our case. So that was another important thing that we needed. Of course, we, we chose Flink. And, and this is the final uh, design of, of the solution. We, we have three parts. The first one is the detection part. We consume clicks and displays from Kafka. And we have um, many, many jobs in Flink uh, for all the different rules. And then we output everything again to Kafka. And then we have a, a Finatra application uh, running on Mesos. This is to consolidate all the invalid traffic that we detect. And that is uh, then uh, served uh, through a REST API to all the applications that have an interface with the outside world. And basically, the, what they do is they, we have a, a client uh, running on each of them. And they update periodically this, this blacklist. Uh, an example of a rule is what we call over clicker, someone that clicks many times. And this is, this is a screenshot of the code. Uh, this is just to show you how easy it is for us to write a new rule. Um, this is basically getting the, the user IDs that uh, have a, a number of clicks higher than a threshold. And uh, this is a sliding window. That's about it. It's, it's very simple. And, and with this, I, I close the, the topic of, of the rule engine. And, and now I want to show you what we do with Kafka and also with watermarks. Um, for Kafka, we have um, data centers around the world, and we have in each data center a Kafka cluster. And at the same time, we have uh, a process that is running also on Mesos, and it injects periodically a, a message, which is the watermark. And this message is, is just has the current timestamp. And um, all this data is later on replicated into uh, a cluster, a Kafka cluster that we have in Paris. All the data that we process with Flink is, is processed in, in Paris. And because we have many data centers, um, we have to consolidate everything into, into one cluster, but this is mainly because of a business uh, constraint. Um, basically, we can have a user ID here and here, so that's why we need to put together these two. And so what we see in, in Paris when we consume from this uh, cluster is basically messages, but at the same time, we have two different watermarks. And in the Flink side, what we needed to do was keep track of these uh, watermarks that we see. And we needed to have uh, a table in memory, uh, just keeping track of the, of the minimum of each data center and each partition. This is because if there was any delay in any replication from any data center or any, 
a problem with any partition, we, we needed to wait for it. But there was an issue, and the problem was that this was kept in memory, and it was not persisted in the state. There is no uh, way to persist it in the state in, in Flink. And so we had the problem that one day uh, the replication went down, and at the same time we restarted the job. And so we basically had messages, but we didn't see, let's say in this case, the Hong Kong watermark, but we had the Tokyo watermark. So in, in Flink, basically what we had was this, and so the job just kept, kept on going. Um, the consequence of this, because some of the rules do a ratio of clicks and displays, was that we were starting to flag uh, as invalid more of the traffic that we should have. So we started to lose money. And what we did uh, as, a, as a solution for this was basically extract the, the logic of keeping track of the latest watermark into another process that is also running on Mesos. And we, we took it out um, of, of the logic of, of Flink. And so this, this process over here knows how many data centers there are, how many partitions, and so it knows that it has to wait uh, in case of, uh, of a problem. Uh, as a result, uh, from the Flink side, this is what we see. We, we see only one watermark, which is the right thing. And by doing that, we, we ended up solving the problem. And at the same time, um, we, we adjusted the, the Flink jobs to assign the timestamp and watermarks uh, at the source and not later on in the, in, in the flow. And I think that's about it. I just want to, yeah, sorry. I just want, I want to add one thing about uh, Kafka Slim. So if we look back at uh, the previous slide here, uh, <coughs> I want just to say that with Kafka Slim, we created the role engine, but uh, the time to market to create a new role was pretty huge. We, for instance, we created a role like computing the CTR between uh, clicks and display. Uh, we took maybe one month to, 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 do, to do the role. And we found that it will not be scalable enough uh, because the purpose of a role engine is to ingest rules and to have more rules, um, to have them as many rules as possible. And with Kafka, it was not possible. So we decided to use Flink also because Flink has a support for SQL. And so we can think of uh, giving an interface to some analytics people who will create the query themselves and then push the query into production. So I would say that the main disadvantage of uh, Kafka Stream was the, the, the fast uh, development cycle. Yeah. And that's it.